اهلا بكل الذين ينضمون للاستماع الى راديو بلدي او الراديو العربي الامريكي ويعنى بقضايا الحرب في المحشر. برامجنا في راديو بلدي كل يوم جمعه من الثامنه وحتى التاسعه صباحا مع ليلى الحسيني لبث حي ومباشر عبر دبليو ان زي كي راديو 690 اي ام. صباح الخير بلدي صباح الخير لكل مستمعينا. Welcome to Radio Baladi, the first Arab, Middle Eastern and American simulcast radio show. Radio Baladi is broadcast every Friday morning on WNCK 690 AM from 8 until 9 Eastern Time on Good Morning Michigan with Layla Al-Husseini. Our call in number 248-557-3300. And now, stay tuned for the best radio talk show on Arab and American issues with your host, Layla Al-Husseini. <laughs> Join me on the third Friday of each month at 8 a.m. Eastern Standard Time. I'll be discussing some of the most important current political, economic, and social issues in my program, The Bridge, on Radio Baladi, on America's Voice of the Arab, WNDK. 9 a.m. and WGMV 700 a.m. Good morning, everybody, and welcome to a new episode on U.S. Arab Radio. This is your host, Dr. Sahar Kamiz, assistant professor in the Department of Communication at the University of Maryland College Park and an expert on Arab and Muslim media. Our topic today is going to be preparing Muslim scholars and preachers of the future. It is no secret that the number of Muslims living in the diaspora continue to grow. Their mobility, dynamism, visibility, and diversity continue to increase as well. Therefore, it becomes necessary to consider the crucial issue of preparing and training a new generation of Muslim scholars and preachers who can address the needs of these Muslims in the diaspora in the best possible way and to help them to integrate and to be included into their new host societies while trying to bridge the gap between themselves and the others and to open new channels of two-way communication and intercultural interfaith dialogue. We will be addressing a number of important issues related to this topic today, including how to best prepare these new modern teachers and scholars educationally, culturally, and technologically, the kinds of challenges facing them, and how to best address them. With me this morning to address this important topic, are two very highly qualified and distinguished guests, Imam Muhammad Bashar Arafat and Imam Dawood Walid. Imam Muhammad Bashar Arafat was born and raised in Damascus, Syria. He attended Damascus University and graduated with a degree in Islamic studies and Arabic language. He served as Imam in Damascus as well as in many parts of the U.S., including the, the Society of Baltimore, Maryland. He also co-founded a new institute for Islamic studies and Arabic language in Baltimore, co-founded a new mosque in Kearney, Maryland, and was imam there from 1995 to 1997. Currently, he is president of the Islamic Affairs Council of Maryland, which is based in Baltimore. Uh, he also serves as chaplain and imam at Johns Hopkins University, and a drum chaplain at Johns Hopkins Hospital, uh, and Muslim chaplain for Baltimore City Police Department. And since moving to Baltimore in 1989, he has been heavily involved in interfaith work and interfaith activities, nationally and internationally. He received the Interreligious Dialogue and Reconciliation Award from Clergy Beyond Borders in Washington, D.C., and he is founder and president of Civilizations Exchange and Cooperation Foundation, which aims to bring people together and to create better interfaith dialogue. Imam Dawood Walid is the executive director of the Michigan chapter of the Council of American Islamic Relations, CARE, a chapter of America's largest advocacy and civil liberties organization for Muslims. He is also a preacher of Islamic faith delivering sermons at Islamic Center across America and is a political blogger for the Detroit News. He has spoken and given many talks at institutions of higher learning about Islam and interfaith dialogue, including DePaul University, Harvard University, and many other places. He has been a regular contributor to the Muslim Observer newspaper and the Ayoub magazine, he has also been interviewed and quoted in many different national and international media outlets, including Al Jazeera, BBC, CNN, Fox News, and others. And uh, he is also a blogger with the Detroit News, and he has served in the United States Navy under honorable conditions, earning two United States Navy and Marine Corps Achievement Awards. Welcome to the show this morning. Thank you. 
Thank you very much for being with us today. And I would like to address my first uh, question to you, Imam Bashar, uh, which is really about uh, the mission and the goal of the institute that you are currently heading in Baltimore, and how does it really serve the goal of training modern uh, preachers and Islamic scholars today? Well, first of all, uh, thank you very much, and it's an honor and a pleasure to be with you and to uh, communicate with your listeners uh, everywhere. Uh, Assalamu alaikum, and uh, I would like to start by just uh, saying that uh, the Civilizations Exchange and Cooperation Foundation, or what we call CECF, really uh, started uh, when I was uh, a campus imam at Johns Hopkins uh, University, and I have seen the need for creating uh, uh, a program that uh, will you know, uh, address the issues of exchange and cultural exchange on campuses as well as for the young uh, professionals uh, who were either born in the United States or grew up in the United States. Uh, because I realized that we don't have an accredited uh, organization that will work uh, with different colleges and universities to take the students, those who are interested to study Islamic studies or Arabic language, or they are engaged in international relations. And that was uh, before 9-11. But after 9-11, uh, I have received requests also from clergy here in the United States that they would like to travel with us and uh, be with an imam uh, who will do these programs for them in uh, different Muslim countries, whether it's in the Middle East or Africa or Southeast Asia, and now in, uh, in Europe as well. But later on, uh, we started uh, catering for the cultural exchange students here in America who come every year through the State Department, and they live with host families. Uh, this is one of the programs called Yes Program. And uh, I suggested after two years to start uh, a conference for those students, the conference called Better Understanding for a Better World, BUBW, which is now held three times a year in Orlando, in San Diego, and in Baltimore, and brings students from almost uh, 30 to 40 countries. And uh, I realized after, you know, 10 conferences that it would be important for imams and clergy from the Middle East or different Muslim countries to come for two weeks program in the United States and part of their uh, tour uh, in the United States and uh, lectures and uh, engagement with the, with the society at large to attend uh, that kind of conference and see the importance of outreach, the importance of understanding global diversity, and the importance of go beyond interface to have programs on the ground and how to communicate with people of the, not only different religions, but also different cultures, and how to be involved in uh, creating leadership programs on a global level. Because uh, I studied at the Sharia University in the Mount, but we have never had uh, an exchange program. Mm -hmm. And I have realized that also other universities in the Middle East or in uh, in Asia, in Africa, uh, the Sharia uh, universities or madrasas or whatever do not have exchange programs to help those who are studying and who might be imams either in, in America or in Europe or in, uh, in a country outside of their own to understand the, 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 the rapid change of the cultural uh, issues today and especially now with the internet and after the Facebook era and the Twitter, really uh, I have seen that uh, Sharia universities are lacking to have uh, uh, an, uh, an opportunity for, for their students, for their graduates, to, uh, to see the current issues happening right now. And especially after 9-11 and now after what used to be called the Arab Spring. Mm -hmm. So yeah. this is now uh, a whole reality mm -hmm. because we are living uh, in a time where we have never seen that number of immigrants mm -hmm. from what's so-called the Muslim world mm -hmm. to Europe and the United States. We have never seen you know, millions and millions of quote-unquote Muslims uh, traveling and living, and not only that, but also becoming citizens of this country. So we don't have in our 
fatwa and in our sharia how to become a citizen uh, and how and then what's the the importance of this uh, citizenship what's the importance of your american passport or british passport or french passport and then how do you use it on a global level mm-hmm. for the benefit of ya ayyuhannas all mankind Absolutely. and how do you reach out to people of different faith traditions uh, not to talk only about comparative religions how to prove you that you are wrong, and how to prove that I'm the only right and everybody is wrong this mm-hmm. is something the quran addressed as Allah is the one who is going to judge between the people in the day of judgment. But for us, on the surface of this earth, yes, we can talk about interfaith, we can talk about theological differences, but then we have to move to something beyond interfaith and how to cooperate and create programs on a global level that benefit the diaspora community and then benefit where you came from. This is an area uh, I thought it's very important to be addressed. Absolutely, and it seems to me that your institute is really contributing greatly uh, in terms of filling this very important gap or this very important vacuum that we have today in terms of training uh, contemporary and modern uh, imams. Imam Dawood, if I move to you, and Imam Bashar mentioned actually the use of social media. He mentioned the use of Twitter and Facebook and blogs. And I know that you are, as a young, educated uh, imam, have been using the social media uh, really extensively yourself. If you can talk a little bit on the importance of using these social media venues and how you personally use them in terms of your own role as imam and preacher. Well, one point uh, that is, uh, and I've, I'm dis- I've discussed this with our, our imams here. I'm, I'm a member of the uh, of our local imam shura council, and I have stressed this to the imams uh, uh, continuously, is that uh, many of our youth, uh, are not regularly coming to the masajid. So as imams in, in, uh, in Shuyuk, we then have to think about where are the youth at and where the youth are at on social media. And uh, there are many types of messages that youth are getting uh, on social media. Some of them are uh, socially uh, socially repugnant, but there are also people who have a very skewed and extreme interpretations of Islam that are on social media. So I believe that it's the it's actually a job or a responsibility of the imams that they really uh, should be trained in terms of, uh, of social media and how to use uh, Twitter. Some of the um, uh, younger uh, American-born uh, imams in particular, like uh, Sheikh uh, Suhaib Webb, who's in Boston, uh, Dr. Yasser Qadi, uh, uh, my my brother and friend in Canada, uh, Sheikh uh, Faraz Rabani, they're all on uh, uh, Twitter. And uh, many youth come and ask questions. Uh, they also post their, their different muhadara or their lectures, their khutbah uh, online, and they, they give the opportunity to uh, extend their message about the, the real uh, traditional practices in, in uh, Aqidah or Creed of Islam. Uh, they are actually probably reaching more people, and especially more younger Muslims on the Twitter and on the Facebook, than actually those youth who are attending the the, the Friday sermons or or coming to halakha after after the fa- after the Fajr prayer. Absolutely, and this is really important in terms of thinking about the different educational, cultural, and technological aspects that have to be taken into account in training this new generation of Muslim scholars in order to enable them to best address the issues and challenges confronting their, uh, their own society, the societies they came from originally, as well as the whole society they are living uh, in now in uh, the diaspora. We will continue back to revisit this important topic after taking this commercial break. Please feel free to call us at the studio uh, to join our conversation, and we will be back again after this commercial break. The number you can call us at is 248-557-3300. Stay tuned. Life is a nonprofit charity that's provided humanitarian aid and development to people and communities for over 25 years, regardless of race, color, religion, or cultural background. When disaster occurs here or around the world, Life for Relief and Development rushes in to provide food, medical aid, and shelter to those in need. Please help improve these efforts. Make your tax-deductible donation to Life now at lifeusa.org or call 248-424-7493. Are you going to start a restaurant or grocery store soon? Do you need floor plans and designs? 
Call Naji Abood at 734-744-9796. Do you want to buy kitchen and restaurant equipment at discount prices? Call Naji Abood now, 734-744-9796. New Concept Products and Design, the trademark of kitchen equipment. 5% discount on all purchases of $75,000 or more. New Concept Products and Design, new location, 31185 Schoolcraft in Livonia. Learn more at www.newconceptproducts.com. Call Naji Abood, 734-744-9796. Ziad Brand, quality products from our family to yours. Ziad Brothers Importing offers the finest quality products, including brands like Sultan, Kraft, Nestle, Hook, Rigo Picon, Dana, and many more. Ask your retailer to carry these fine products because you deserve the very best. For more information, visit our website at www.ziad.com. That's www.ziad.com. Ziad, quality products from our family to yours. to reproductive medicine, IVF Michigan Fertility Centers are the recognized leaders. With locations in Bloomfield Hills and five other cities in Michigan and Ohio, IVF has experts in all aspects of the field. As a founding member of IVF Michigan Fertility Centers, Dr. Nicholas Shama is one of the leading reproductive endocrinologists in Michigan and Ohio. Dr. Shama has performed over 10,000 IVF cases and has helped thousands of couples fulfill their dreams of parenthood. American board certified in both obstetrics and and gynecology and reproductive endocrinology and infertility, Dr. Nicholas Shama is a very caring, compassionate, expert physician that understands not only the medical but also the emotional toil of infertility. This is Dr. Sahar Hamid. Join me on the third Friday of each month at 8 a.m. Eastern Standard Time. discussing some of the most important current political, economic, and social issues in my program, The Bridge, on Radio Balladie, on America's Voice of the Arab, WNDK 690 AM, and WGMZ 700 AM. Welcome back to the show, everybody. Uh, we're again discussing the preparing the Muslim scholars and preachers of the future, educational, cultural, and linguistic and technological considerations. Before the break, we were talking about the role of social media and new media and how it can be best used by this new generation of imams and preachers to spread the message and to correct false misunderstandings of Islam. And I'd like to again revisit this uh, point with you, Imam Dawood, since we left uh, off before the break. And I am, of course, a communication scholar, and I wrote on this topic uh, in my book, Islam.com, Contemporary Islamic Discourses in Cyberspace, it was very clear that there was a big void or a big vacuum. Uh, imam and ulama were not there. They were not online. They were not interacting with young people. They were not addressing some of the issues and misconceptions that were spread through some of the uh, dialogue uh, forums and discussion boards uh, on the Internet. And I wanted to know what are some of the challenges there that uh, inhibit uh, some of these ulama and scholars from really joining this new technological revolution, and how could they be best addressed? Well, I, I think many of the top scholars uh, are actually all on uh, social media, and particularly on Twitter now, and if they aren't tweeting themselves directly, they have someone that's doing it uh, for them. So I do believe that many uh, of, of, the, of the bigger scholars uh, in the Muslim world um, are on Twitter, I think it's our challenge of having more of our imams here locally uh, in the United States of America to be uh, to be properly trained. And I think that there needs to be a training around this about how to use uh, Twitter and Facebook more effectively. But you know, again, if you if you go online, like I I follow many of the big scholars uh, on Twitter right now: uh, uh, Habib uh, uh, Ali Jifri, Mufti Ali Jama. Uh, they're Dr. Yusuf Al-Qaradawi, they're all on uh, on Twitter, uh, but most of their tweets are in on Arabic. But again, 
there are many of the top imams who are uh, in North America, uh, scholars who are on Twitter. I think the challenge is, is to get more of our uh, imams and our masajid to, uh, to, to receive this type of training and, and perhaps even to persuade some of those about the importance of, of being on uh, on the internet, and this also includes uh, YouTube as well, of, of having the uh, the different lectures uh, placed on YouTube so that they can be uh, easily uh, accessible to to people online. Absolutely, and not only in Arabic, but also hopefully in other languages, so they can really cross the bridge and reach out to people from different languages and different cultures. And remember, sure, if you can also elaborate on this point in terms of whether the institute you are currently heading, uh, the Civilizations Exchange and Cooperation Foundation, is actually trying to also fill some of this gap or some of this void in terms of training these new generations of imams, not just educationally and culturally, but also technologically. Um, yes, and uh, uh, we have, as my brother mentioned, uh, a group of uh, young people right now that are uh, in charge of... Uh, of, of that kind of training when we have uh, scholars visiting uh, us from Al-Azhar, from uh, Morocco, and from Jordan, uh, because this is today uh, is extremely important uh, in order to get your message uh, across. And I just would like uh, also to go back to the issue of the training which we are doing, and we call it uh, International Observers Program. Uh, today, really, I also... Uh, see the need for uh, because you are talking about two kind of imams those who are uh, you know grew up in America or born in America and then those who are immigrants and uh, um, they graduated from different countries myself one of them and came to this country and to understand the the reality and the the condition of the society in order to be more effective uh, I wish that these kind of experiences also will be taught in different uh, universities and uh, different uh, madrasas in other countries, especially for those imams who are intending to come here and to make it shorter for them. Uh, you know, to have this experience in a nutshell, so they will have it as a course uh, before they come here, or if they came here to have uh, these intensive courses in order to uh, move quickly in uh, being successful in your outreach, whether it is for the youth or for the uh, society at large. And I have, uh, you know, seen that this is very important when you want to talk uh, to the women here in America. Uh, they have completely different uh, perspective than women in the in the Arab world or in in other Asian or African countries. Or if you want to uh, reach out to the youth, or if you want to reach out to uh, for example, hospitals and how to be a chaplain, uh, not necessarily, I mean, full-time or regular, but also how to participate in programs, um, for example, on spirituality. Uh, unfortunately, uh, I don't see uh, that the imams who are coming from other countries are aware of the depth of this issue now here in America. Uh, for example, spirituality and medicine. Uh, I was, I mean, uh, surprised when I was asked at Johns Hopkins Hospital uh, to participate in these uh, conferences. And this issue takes, uh, uh, you know, uh, uh, a great importance uh, within the uh, society when it comes to, you know, uh, holistic healing and uh, spirituality and medicine, spirituality and crisis. Uh, this is all ingrained in our uh, religion uh, in the Quran, but uh, as well as in the uh, life of Prophet Muhammad Sallallahu but but still again has to be really addressed in a way uh, that uh, the 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 du'a, the imams can also present it to the society who is searching, uh, you know, through yoga and through other Hindu practices or Buddhist uh, practices, and we have it a lot. Uh, Yes, it's called Sufism, but well, I'm talking about the, uh, the 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 spiritual practices that it is mentioned in the Quran and the tradition of Prophet Muhammad without any of these uh, innovations that has nothing to do with the pure message. This is very important when you mix that also with all of these uh, 
sometimes, you know, fatawa or answers or coming from the, you know, the Arab world or other countries. Uh, and people here are picking up on this uh, fatawa without uh, understanding how to convey this fatawa to a society that have no clue uh, who you are uh, on the first place and they are looking at you uh, in, in a negative light. Uh, so this is really important, number one, to understand the, uh, the society and also to have uh, the ability to convey a message that mixed with wisdom and uh, a spiritual approach. Absolutely, and it, I think it all comes back again to the issue of education and curriculum development. How can we change some of the educational curricula in our Arab world and Muslim world at large to include some very new important topics and issues that really need to be tackled today? Uh, for example, you know, I, I'm Egyptian, I come from Egypt, and we have Al-Azhar University, which is a great university of learning and a uh, great mosque, and people come from different parts of the world to study there. But a lot of the knowledge that's given is purely religious. What if we try to develop the curriculum to also include uh, side by side with the religious education some new forms of topics or subjects or a uh, new modern types of education that really prepare the imams for, uh, to be ambassadors for the faith abroad? Imam Dawood, would you like to comment a little bit on what needs to be added to the educational curricula in uh, our Arab and Muslim world today to better educate these imams? Um, well, if I can add on, I think that actually as far as the, the of the development and the advancement of the American Muslim community, I want to be particular that if we if we look at the the, the evolution and the spread of Islam and uh, how it took root in, in various civilizations, and I'll give you uh, I'll use Mali as an example. Uh, when when Islam spread to uh, Mali in the uh, in West Africa, the you know. Uh, uh, in the very beginning, there were people who were non-Malians that basically began to be the, the primary preachers or teachers of the of the faith. But as decades uh, went uh, went along, uh, the indigenous people of Mali ended up being the the imams and leaders of the land because they, I mean, they went and studied uh, Islam formally uh, either in Mali or places like Morocco or Egypt, but they had a visceral uh, uh, connection. To the people, and they already had a level of cultural competency. So, when we're talking about uh, cultural competency or cultural literacy, I do believe there needs to be some sort of uh, 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 curriculum development uh, for people uh, and imams who are coming here. At the same time, I believe that it should be the goal of the American Muslim community that in 20, 30 years from now, uh, we need to get out of the importing uh, imams business, uh, and I believe this is one of the important functions that uh, Zaytuna College has started out in California with Sheikh Hamza Yusuf and Imam Zayd Shakar, uh, uh, because there needs to be a, uh, a type of system where there's traditional Islamic studies as well as liberal arts, but uh, primarily training people who already have um, you know, a, a visceral connection to this land and already understood well, we can say the, the, the unspoken language that goes on in the American uh, culture. And people can speak English, but there's an unspoken language. There's, mm -hmm. there's, there's unspoken cues. And uh, those, things are very, those things are very hard to, uh, to, to teach, and it takes a long time. Uh, and a person has to live in a certain area to really grasp these things. These types of things can't be learned uh, in a textbook or in a PowerPoint presentation. They, they simply mm -hmm. can't. Yeah, that's a very important point. It's not just about the language acquisition, just learning the foreign language. It's also about the cultural cues. It's about understanding the nuances, the cultural nuances of this particular society, which in some cases I think would be hard to, uh, to accomplish. But I think it's important to have in parallel both imams coming from other parts of the world as well as, you know, those indigenous imams from within the country itself. Both of them, I think, are much needed today in order to, uh, you know, inoculate and advance because of, of Islamic awareness and international understanding of Islam uh, worldwide. Well, I, I, well I, I think it's near right now because we haven't developed that stage, but like if you look at any Muslim majority country, like you don't see a large amount of, of Egyptians preaching in Malaysia or in mm -hmm. Pakistan. There, there are Malaysians and there are Pakistanis who are the primary imams and the leaders in Malaysia and Pakistan. This is the... The, the historical spread, this, this has happened all over the Muslim world. So 
we do have a large immigrant uh, population, and we don't want to uh, marginalize the imams are, that are here. But um, it, it is it is my strong belief that uh, as, as decades come uh, come into the future, that uh, we really do need to have the majority uh, of our imams who are who are born and raised right here. And then also, when I say imams, I don't want to exclude. Uh, women either, because we also have a very strong need to have qualified and trained Islamic teachers and Islamic scholars who are women. I think in many of our discussions and conversations, we talk about uh, Islamic leadership or those who teach Islam as just being of the male gender, but in fact, we need a lot of people like Sayyid Nafisa, uh, anha, who is the, the great uh, scholar who's, uh, who's buried in Egypt right now, who was who is a uh, who is a ustad of, of Imam Shafi? So we, we need we need great Muslim and more uh, Islamic scholars here in America who are women as well. I cannot agree more with you. I think it's very important. I'm very very glad that you raised this important point about the importance of educating Muslim women and better preparing them to play a leadership leadership role as uh, as uh, scholars and preachers of the Muslim faith. And we'll come back to revisit this point again after this commercial break. Please stay tuned. Ziad Brand, quality products from our family to yours. Ziad Brothers Importing offers the finest quality products, including brands like Sultan, Kraft, Nestle, Hook, Rigo Picon, Dana, and many more. Ask your retailer to carry these fine products because you deserve the very best. For more information, visit our website at www.ziad.com. That's www.ziad.com. Ziad. Quality products from our family to yours. Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullah. Bismillah wa rahmatullah. Rahmat al-Ghathiyyah. Nataqaddam bi ajmal al-tahani wa tabrikat lil-alam ajma' bi munasabat al-ayad. ونسأل الله أن يعيد الأعياد علينا وعلى الإنسانية جمعاء باليوم والخير والبركة وبهذه المناسبة ندعوكم ونذكركم أن لا تنسوا المتضررين والمنكوبين في كل أنحاء العالم الذين يطمحون أن يعيشوا بسلام وأمان هذه السنة الجديدة سنة خير وحب ومحبة وسلام للعالم أجمعين ونكون إن شاء الله في العام القادم قد حققنا لجميع أبناء الإنسانية الرفاة وقدمنا لأبنائنا ما نستطيع من سعادة ورسمنا على وجوه الأبرياء الابتسامة وقدمنا الفرحة لقلوب الأرامل واليتامى والمساكين فندعوكم جميعا أجل أن يكتمل العيد أن نتذكر بعضنا بعضا وأن نشد بعضنا بعضا وأن نكون على قلب رجل واحد لأن الإنسانية لن تنعم بهذا إلا إذا شعرنا من داخل قلوبنا أن حقنا وواجبنا والواجب علينا أن نكون على قلب رجل واحد نشعر ببعضنا بعضا ونحب بعضنا بعضا لتنعم هذه الأرض بالأمان والسلام وكل عام وأنتم بخير بدأناه معكم وعهدناكم على أن نستمر بمزيد من المتعة والعروض الحصرية على قناتي زي ألوان وزي أفلام زي ألوان هي أول وأكبر قناة مسلسلات عربية هندية في أمريكا أضخم الإنتاجات مسلسلات حصرية ومع زي أفلام فأنتم على موعد مع مغامرة جديدة كل يوم لاكتشاف سحر بولي تابعوا حصريا قناة زي ألوان وزي أفلام الآن في أمريكا على ديش نتورك وصلينك تي في When you're looking for the best in optical care Dr. Imad Nakash is your doctor to see With years of experience and thousands of successful procedures performed You can trust your eyes to Dr. Imad Nakash 
See Dr. Imad Nakash and his professional staff for your eye care needs. There's two locations to serve you. In Hazel Park, call 248-336-3937. 248-336-3937. In Rochester Hills, call 248-299-3937. That's 248-299-3937. This is Dr. Sahar Hamid. Join me on the third Friday of each month at 8 a.m. Eastern Standard Time. I'll be discussing some of the most important current political, economic, and social issues in my program, The Bridge. On Radio Baladi, on America's Voice of the Arab, WNDK 690 AM, and WGNZ 700 AM. Welcome back to the show, everybody. This is your host, Dr. Sahar Kamim. And with me this morning is Imam Muhammad Bashar Arafat and Imam Dawood Wallet discussing preparing the Muslim scholars and preachers of the future, some of the most important educational, cultural and technological considerations. Feel free to call us with your questions and comments at 248-557-3300. We'd love to hear from you. And before going to the commercial break, uh, Imam Dawood Wallet touched upon a very important point, which is really the vacuum of the void in terms of uh, including women as uh, scholars of the Islamic faith and as preachers and ulama and leaders themselves. And Imam Bashar, I wanted to ask you if your uh, institute uh, is inclusive of women and how do you see the inclusion of women into uh, this whole realm of Islamic leadership and preaching? Uh, of course. I mean, um, uh, our programs have uh, um, a lot of uh, time dedicated for the for the women, whether they are in space or those who are coming from abroad. We did the training program for uh, a from Jordan, the, the embassy sent uh, 12 uh, last year and they attended the, the program and they, they really uh, realized that a lot of things uh, could be learned from the experience of Muslims here in America. Uh, of course, uh, those who are born here in this country and those uh, either who grew up uh, or the converts, uh, uh, they have to be engaged and they have to be encouraged uh, to be uh, at, the, at the Islamic centers or different uh, organizations and different interfaith organizations and to do the outreach uh, here in this country. It's, it's very, very important to uh, also share that with our uh, brothers and sisters in other countries uh, and their curriculums, the importance of uh, women here uh, in America or in Europe. Uh, I just came back from doing a program also uh, in, in, in Italy and I have seen uh, that this issue is so much needed uh, also over there. So really, uh, these kind of uh, exchanges which I'm talking about and uh, um, to share the experience of uh, the community in America with with people from other countries, this is the the, the next topic. I hope uh, we will have time to speak about. But this is uh, important as well. And when you are, uh, you know, when you have your activities here in the U.S., it's very important to uh, have our sisters uh, visible and to have them. Uh, engaged properly and they have the, the education from uh, this country and if they needed to, to travel and study also to come back and to to show that uh, the Quran emphasized on both men and women and especially in Surah Al-Hujurat you will see 10 description uh, in the Muslimina wal Muslimat and you will see a Mu'minina wal Mu'minat as Sa'imina wal Sa'imat so this is the Quran always addressing uh, for men, uh, men and women but unfortunately uh, somehow, uh, there are certain cultural practices in other Arab countries or other Muslim countries has nothing to do with religion. This is purely culture. And sometimes the people here in the United States look at these kind of practices as religion and they don't know that this is culture. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. That's a very important point also, the uh, mixing up of culture and religion, which sometimes really uh, gives a bad name to Islam. 
for practices that are completely non-Islamic, like honor killing or, uh, you know, female genital mutilation and all of that stuff, which is really not Islamic at all, but which uh, sometimes is attributed falsely to, um, to Islam, unfortunately. Cultural literacy. And when I stood with those pastors and there were people of many different ethnicities calling for justice, we can't be naive as Americans and say that uh, America is a post-racial society or we are colorblind. Uh, from the very starting of the United States of America, there's always been racial hierarchy. There is, um, there is uh, vast differences as far as investigations, prosecutions, and convictions in this country, and they have a direct relationship on race. And I think that we, uh, as American Muslims, we can give a balanced approach on both sides uh, from both uh, discussing the, the unity of, of mankind and what Islam says and also speak out against the disease of al-Ansariya, of, of al-Asabiya, of the racism and tribalism that unfortunately affects the day-to-day -day lives of, 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 of Americans, in which and it's not just a situation with uh, African Americans, but Arab Americans, South Asian Americans, Another. So uh, it's not the way of Islam uh, to just uh, ignore problems or issues. But and just for the record, my speaking with those pastors, mm -hmm. and there were Jews and Christians uh, mm -hmm. there, uh, everything was peaceful. Uh, calling for, for justice and, uh, and, and speaking out against murder, uh, mm -hmm. there was no violence uh, involved at all. Everything was 100% peaceful. It seems to me that we're also here addressing a broader issue, really, which I wanted to touch upon, which is the acceptance of the other with a capital O, right? The whole idea of inclusion, the whole idea of reaching out and accepting the other seems to be a major, major challenge, uh, you know, whether it is culturally based, racially based, gender based. Uh, we need to be more inclusive of others, and this has to be a two-way process. We accept others, others also should accept us. And that is the point I would like to touch upon. Uh, Imam Bashar, if you can give us quickly, like in two minutes before the commercial break, your thoughts on this whole idea of inclusion and why so far it has not been as successful as we'd like it to be. Thank you very much. Uh, I really would like to say that this is uh, so clearly mentioned in the Quran and the life of Prophet Muhammad Wasallam. but unfortunately our curriculums need to re-emphasize on this extremely uh, well, uh, because uh, we are living in a time it's completely than 100 years ago, uh, I mean, let alone a couple of hundred years before that. So uh, the culture we are living in, uh, you know, it is extremely important on us to not only understand the other from the, uh, the, the perspective of the Quran and how uh, included everyone and how ask us to work with everyone with respect and uh, uh, not to let the uh, cultural or uh, ethnic issues comes in between, and we have to lead the way in educating uh, others that uh, uh, it is the, the Qur'an who, who called for, for respect, it is the Qur'an who called uh, for no compulsion in religion, it is the Qur'an who, who called for uh, let us cooperate with any one who would like to work for righteousness and, and good deeds for, for the entire humanity. And that leads for, for acceptance, that leads not only for tolerance, but also for coexistence and harmony. And uh, th these topics really has to be revisited in the, in the, uh, in the curriculums, in the trainings, uh, because this is uh, important here in America, as well as in Europe, not only interface, but also outreach programs, having receptions, having... Uh, uh, events uh, in our centers to reach out and honor uh, people of different faith traditions and especially uh, like now here law enforcement or firefighters and to do you know events for them and to make them feel that they are part of the society and we, we are appreciating what they are doing on behalf of the entire society but acceptance of the other that is so clearly mentioned in the Quran and it is to me, the verse of the 21st century, when we read in Al-Hujurat, uh, verse 13, when Almighty says, all mankind, not even all Muslims, mm -hmm. or, or you who believe, but all mankind, we cre I created you, or we, uh, that's the way, or we, from, uh, uh, I mean, men and women, in order to know one another. And 
today the the whole message of lita'arafu and to know one another has to be uh, addressed and we have to have 10 you know lines under this word how do you transfer this word into a global project and local project at the same time Absolutely, and we will come back again to revisit this important point because I'm particularly very concerned about it. After this commercial break, please stay tuned. مؤسسة الحياة للغاتة والتنمية تتمنى لكم عيادة مباركة وكل عام وأنتم بخير. العطاء قصة رائعة. بدايتها إنسان يهتم ونهايتها إنسان يحتاج. مؤسسة الحياة للغاتة والتنمية. ومنذ أكثر من 25 عاما تحمل عطائك إلى من يستحقه ويحتاجه بغض النظر عن الجنس أو العرق أو الدين فأينما تكون الحاجة تجد الحياة تقدم المساعدة الطبية والملاجئ وبناء المدارس والأوار الارتوازية وبرامج كفالة عوائل اللاجئين والأيتام وغيرها حسب الحاجة للمساعدة في استمرار هذا الجهد الكبير إن تبرعك المعفى من الضرائب اليوم إلى منظمة الحياة للإغاثة والتنمية عبر الموقع www.lifeusa.org أو الاتصال على الرقم المجاني 1-800-827-3543 أسواق زمزم الواقع على 24065 أورشد لك في مدينة فاركنكتون هالز ترحب بالجالية العربية والكلدانية تنزلة كبيرة على عموم المواد الغذائية في يوم الأربعاء من كل أسبوع لا تنسوا فرش كاري اوت جميع انواع المعجنات وايضا صواني الكمبو المشكله والصمون الحار لحوم حلال الجاليه العربيه والاسلاميه الملحمه باداره قصاب الجاليه المعروف سلوان جربوع زوروهم على 24065 اورشد ليك في مدينه فارمكتون هيلز او اتصلوا بهم على 248-476-0300 اسواق زمزم للمذاق عنوان لجميع طلباتكم اتصلوا على 248-476-0300 اسواق زمزم للمعامله راقية وكرم الضيافة عنوان بدأناه معكم وعهدناكم على أن نستمر بمزيد من المتعة والعروض الحصرية على قناتي زي ألوان وزي أفلام زي ألوان هي أول وأكبر قناة مسلسلات عربية هندية في أمريكا أضخم الإنتاجات مسلسلات حصرية ومعازي أفلام فأنتم على موعد مع مغامرة جديدة كل يوم لاكتشاف سحر بولو تابعوا حصريا قناة زي ألوان وزي أفلام الآن في أمريكا على ديش نتورك كوستلينج تي في قشات ميديترينيان ماركت بإدارة سهر قشات وأولاده يرحبون بالجالية العربية والكلدانية جميع أنواع المواد الغذائية البان طازجة الكرزات والبهارات الطازجة داخل الأسواق مطعم ميديترينيان شيش كباب يقدم يوميا جميع أنواع الكباب المقبلات العربية العراقية وصواني الكامبو المميزة تفتح الأسواق من الثامنة إلى التاسعة مساء من الاثنين وحتى السبت ومن الثامنة صباحا إلى التاسعة مساء يوم الأحد تقع الأسواق على 3239 North Western Highway في مدينة فارمينغتون هيلز لحوم حلال الجالية الإسلامية لطلباتكم من المطعم كول 2485387855 ذات 2485387855 قشة ميديترينيان ماركت خدمة متميزة ومعاملة راقية This is Dr. Sahar Khalid. Join me on the third Friday of each month at 8 a.m. Eastern Standard Time. I'll be discussing some of the most important current political, economic, and social issues in my program, The Bridge. On Radio Baladi, on America's Voice of the Arab, WNDK 690 AM and WGMV 700 AM. Welcome back to the show, everyone. This is your host, Dr. Sahar Kamil. With me this morning, Imam Muhammad Bashar Arafat and Imam Dawood Wallace discussing the preparation of Muslim scholars and preachers of the future. And I would like to go back briefly to the point about inclusion of the other and dialogue, because it seems to me, unfortunately, in many parts of the Arab and Muslim world, 
there is this mentality of, you know, if you're not with me, you're against me. There is not this mentality of, let me accept you despite our differences. And as Imam Bashar was saying, it has nothing to do with Islam. Islam is very inclusive, very accepting of the other. But it seems to me that there are some challenges when it comes to really spreading this message of dialogue and accepting it. Why, why are there certain challenges there, uh, Imam Bashar, if you can touch upon this quickly? And how could these challenges be best addressed? Thank you. Uh, we really have to stand up uh, very firm against these voices that is coming to us from, uh, I mean, whether it's from outside the United States or from inside the United States, <laughs> and uh, presenting uh, our religion as the religion of uh, inclusivity only for Muslims and everybody else, uh, you know, that you are not Muslim, you are kafir, you are mushrik, you are fine. That's, uh, there are so many definitions, uh, but you have to understand that also Almighty repeated the word anas in the Quran 240 times. And for your information, as you know, the last chapter in the, uh, in the Quran is called anas, mankind. And the word anas, that chapter was repeated six times in order for me to understand that I am part of this community, Anas. And we have to work together and we have to reach out. Not only, as I mentioned before, when we study comparative religion, we have to move uh, to the next point, how to cooperate with others. So, uh, we have to, I mean, come up with these kind of programs and has to be headed by the, by the mosques to show the community what is the essentials of our religion and when it comes to the other and when it comes to uh, respecting the other, not only that, but also coming up with programs and learning how to get funding for these programs because when you, uh, when you show that you are working for the others, then you will have also a lot of funding. You don't have to raise this fund only from the Muslim community, but then you are going to be including everybody else. And this is one topic has to be, you know, clarified for our du'as and imams that there are millions and millions of dollars are there for those who would like to do programs for the other, and you are part of the other. Mm -hmm. So this is very important to... Uh, understand the nature of, of, of this word which is mentioned under Ya Yohannas, O Mankind, and how to raise fund for that uh, in a way that you will be amazed when you will see that there are so many people, not only Muslims, but uh, uh, others, are more than happy to work with you and to cooperate with you because your goal is Ya Yohannas, not mm -hmm. only Ya Yohannas, Ladina Amanu. Correct, and I think that actions speak louder than words. So the value of participating in these programs, exchange programs, cultural programs, educational programs, is to show with action, not just with words, that we are truly inclusive and considering uh, the other in our initiative. Uh, Imam Dawood, in the few remaining minutes of our program, I'd like to address the issue of uh, fatwa. Those who are not trained to give fatwa, yet they fill you know, the, uh, the air or the newspapers, magazines, uh, sometimes even online fatwas, which are not really coming from trained or educated imams who are equipped to do so. How can we address this issue in the best possible way? We have a few minutes left, please. This is a very big challenge because on the Internet and social media, you have uh, people who are very uh, uh, eloquent speakers. There are people who have memorized a lot of uh, the Quran, a lot of hadith, and they give very uh, eloquent talks. And sometimes, especially the younger people, they can't really uh, uh, tell a difference. Uh, and I'll give an example of, uh, of, of Brother uh, Enwar Alaki, uh, who uh, was a very uh, popular uh, da'i. Uh, many people saw him as being a mufti, but in fact he didn't have the ijazah. He, he wasn't qualified to get any type of fatwa, but yet he had a very large following uh, amongst the youth. I think this is something that is needs to be like clearly uh, discussed within our community uh, in the Sunday schools and to uh, give guidance to the young people about who they should be taking these religious opinions or verdicts from. But the greater challenge is, is to actually get the Muslims into the masajid. Uh, we know that the majority of, of Muslims and youth uh, aren't, uh, aren't regularly going to masajid and getting Islamic uh, training or education to begin with. So really... Uh, 
this type of uh, tabliq or getting the, the the Muslims engaged in Islamic learning is a is a greater challenge. And if we're able to do, to do that, I think that the the issue of people following these bogus fatawa, I think it would it would help uh, clear itself up. Absolutely, and especially now, as you mentioned, with the use of social media, I think it's very important to also make sure people can filter between what is considered to be, you know, good fatwa coming from an accredited source, from a knowledgeable source, and those who are not qualified to do so. What could be some of the tips or clues? You know, now everything could be at, you know, at, your, at your fingertips. Uh, you know, how can you really find out what is authentic and, and correct information and what is not in, in, a, in a few minutes? Well, I, I think the the primary thing, and I, I mean, I'm not sure about how Imam Arafat feels about this, but it's also this type of uh, uh, cherry picking mentality that I see amongst a lot of Muslims. I believe that Muslims should follow a, a, a madhab and that they should take their uh, Islamic knowledge from a particular scholar or credit scholars. And I don't believe that uh, Muslims should be going around just cherry picking here or there about a particular opinion that they think is the best. I think if they uh, have a scholar, there's a scholar who has been classically or traditionally trained and they uh, trust uh, the scholar, they understand his knowledge, they know that he has degrees or he has ijazah in particular uh, subjects that they should um, not blindly follow, but they should place their their, their, their trust in this particular mujtahid or this particular mufti. This is, this, this is, this is my opinion. Right. Uh, we have to wrap up here. Unfortunately, we're running out of time, but this has been a very important conversation. I think we do have a lot of work that needs to be done here in terms of better training and educating a new generation of enlightened Muslim scholars and teachers of the future who can address all the challenges of Muslims in the diaspora and better integrate them in their whole societies and build bridges of intercultural and interfaith dialogue. I would like to thank my guest this morning, Imam Muhammad Bashar Arafat and Imam Dawood Walid for being with me today. Thank you all for listening. This is your host, Dr. Sahar Kamiz. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you.